Well, this is definitely the place to be, and I couldn't be happier to be here, and I thank the Museum of the Confederacy at Appomattox for its hospitality. It's a magnificent institution, as you all know, and if you haven't walked through the exhibit, I hope you will, as it uh, uh, relates very uh, directly to many of the themes of my talk. So today I'm going to uh, talk for about a half hour, maybe a little bit more. I want to leave a lot of time for questions uh, and to get to know folks and sign books and all the rest, and my focus is going to be on uh, press coverage of Appomattox, and I'm going to start in New York City, then as now it was the media capital uh, of America. So 11 p.m., Palm Sunday, April 9, 1865, telegraph dispatches from the War Department reach New York City announcing Lee's surrender. By, by, before midnight even, New Yorkers know on that Sunday, April 9. And in the hours that follow, the word spreads quickly. The city's newspapers churn out extras, extra, extra, read all about it, telling the story of, the, of Grant's triumph, relating the details of his offer of magnanimous terms to the defeated rebels. And, and the news rouses New Yorkers from their beds. Northern diarist Ma uh, Maria Lyd uh, Lydia Daly, for example, noted that at midnight on Sunday, April 9, 1865, she's a denizen of New York City, a newspaper boy on her street called out, surrender of Lee's army, 10 cents and no mistake. His breathless repeat, he had to say no mistake because rumors had been circulated. There had often been false reports, but 10 cents and no mistake. This was a done deal. His breathless report brought hosannas of joy to Daly's lips. And as daylight dawned on April 10, the northern public began to celebrate. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Are we good? Okay. So. Northerners begin to celebrate New York City. Teachers read school children the news and dismiss them from school early who can concentrate uh, on a day as exciting as that. Militiamen fire cannon, churches ring their bells. A sudden eruption of flags bedecks the streets and buildings and plans are made in New York City for a grand celebration, a grand te deum to be sung as part of a Thanksgiving service at Trinity Church the following day. But even as New Yorkers offer up their cheers and prayers, the city's leading newspaper editors begin to jockey for advantage in what would prove to be a fierce competition, the competition to explain exactly what the surrender meant. So I'm going to try this morning to take us back to the raw and uncertain moments following the surrender by focusing our attention on press coverage from Appomattox. And I'll argue that newspapers and journals across the North and South debate the meaning of what happened here at Appomattox, the meaning of Grant's magnanimous terms. Across the political spectrum, Americans applaud those terms, but they have sharply divergent interpretations of what the terms mean. Did Grant's magnanimity to the Confederates serve to exonerate the Confederates? Was it instead intended to affect their repentance and atonement? Uh, these issues and others were debated in the press. And I'll make the case, not a surprising case, that the press coverage of this Appomattox News was highly partisan. And it reveals the depth of bitterness between the victors and vanquished, but also deep divisions within each society. The North is divided and the South is divided. And if we look at press coverage, we see those divisions. So we have to start by observing that in this era of American history, in the mid-19th century, Newspapers made no pretense whatsoever of neutrality. The newspapers openly reflected the agendas of competing political parties, of reform societies, of religious denominations in a much stronger way than they do now. You might say, oh, the New York Times uh, leans democratic. This papers didn't simply lean in this era. They proclaimed their allegiance to political parties on their mastheads. Um, they were the organs of political parties, the organs of reform societies like the abolitionist uh, movement, the organs of religious <coughs> denominations. And we can see this if we look at the North we see newspapers reflecting the political spectrum there in the North. And at one end of that spectrum were abolitionist and radical Republican newspapers. These were newspapers that represented the progressives of their day, those who wanted most to see the Civil War result in massive social change. These progressives, abolitionists, and radical Republicans had pushed during the war for emancipation. They had pushed a reluctant Lincoln towards emancipation. And they pushed now, as the war uh, concludes, for something beyond emancipation, for black civil rights, for full citizenship for African Americans, uh, including uh, voting. In the vanguard among these abolitionists, 
was a man named Horace Greeley. Greeley was the controversial, somewhat irascible chief of the leading anti-slavery newspaper in the North, the New York Tribune. And the minute Greeley receives a dispatch announcing Lee's capitulation, he gets to work. He's going to start drafting editorials explaining the nature and implications of the surrender. The first of these is printed on the morning of April 10, and it begins, quote, Lee has surrendered three words only, but how much they mean. How much indeed. Greeley will argue in his newspaper, the New York Tribune, that Grant's victory was a vindication of the principle of human equality. In Greeley's eyes, Grant's magnanimity to the Confederates, he'd said to Lee's army, you may go home uh, and, and, and uh, remain uh, undisturbed so long as you obey the laws and the places that you head to and, and never again take up arms against the Union. This magnanimity in Greeley's eyes was the means to achieve what Greeley and abolitionists considered a sacred purpose to secure the ascent of the South to emancipation, to change Confederate hearts and minds so Confederates would be open to, uh, to a new social uh, system. Greeley spoke for Northerners who saw Grant's triumph as an emblem of the moral superiority of Northern society. The surrender Greeley wrote in one of these editorials proved that a civilization based on free labor is of a higher and more humane type than one based on slavery. Greeley also argued in these editorials that he churned out in the wake of getting the news of the surrender that there should be no reprisals against the vanquished Confederates, no treason trials and imprisonments and executions and the like. And he explained his reasoning this way. He said, quote, I want as many rebels as possible to live to see the South rejuvenated and transformed by the influence of free labor. So in Greeley's eyes, there was no fitter fate for Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee and other Confederate leaders than to have to live in the new world that the war was going to bring about than to have to bear witness to an unfolding social revolution. Other progressive newspapers in the North sang a similar tune, often with some variation. So to give an example, African-American newspapers in the North, uh, such as the New York City-based Anglo-African and the Philadelphia-based Christian Recorder, that was the organ of the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church, these newspapers emphasized the decisive role that United States colored troops had played in the Union victory. And they argued that this show of patriotism by African Americans had earned for blacks full civil rights and full inclusion into the body politic. For example, the Anglo-African covered in its newspaper accounts of the Appomattox aftermath, covered an Appomattox victory parade in Cincinnati, Ohio in which free blacks had marched under banners proclaiming all men are born equal, this linkage of Grant's victory to, uh, to uh, social justice. The correspondent on that article plaintively asked, quote, have we not won for ourselves a place in the ranks of mankind? This an allusion again to the service of the USCT. So that's an, the abolitionist and radical Republican perspective, if you will, those <laughs> most committed to change. If we move along the northern political spectrum, however, to the middle of the spectrum, we find moderate and mainstream newspapers in the north, uh, newspapers like the New York Times, edited by Henry Raymond, and the uh, New York um, Herald, edited by James Bennett. We find them representing a somewhat different position. These moderates, moderate Republicans, let's take them first. Moderate Republicans were supportive of Lincoln and his aims, but um, uh, were skeptical about the radical Republican and abolitionist agenda. So moderate Republicans supported emancipation as a military necessity, a way to uh, help defeat the Confederates, but they were ambivalent, unsure about black civil rights, about black voting, uh, and about uh, that level of social change. So the editor of the New York Times, who represented this moderate position in this day, rejected Horace Greeley's equation of Appomattox with the prospect of black citizenship, and instead argued in his editorials in the wake of the surrender that Grant's terms were the means to liberate the white South. It was the liberation of the white South that uh, men like uh, Raymond were most interested in. What did this mean? They meant that victory would, in their eyes, redeem the white Southern masses. Most white Southerners did not own slaves before and during the Civil War. Would redeem the white Southern masses from their thraldom to the slaveholding aristocracy. Northerners, Republicans had imagined that there was some resentment against that slaveholding elite on the part of the mass of Southern whites. 
They imagine that union victory and Grant's show of leniency would redeem, disenthrall the Southern masses and speed the order, the advent, as uh, Raymond put it, of order and fraternity. There in the middle of the political spectrum, along with these moderate Republicans, were Democrats, moderate Democrats, sometimes called war Democrats. These were members of the opposition party in the North. They were often quite critical of Lincoln, the Republican, but they were fully committed to union victory. And they, too, believed that Grant's terms principal purpose was to make the Union whole again, to bring those errant Southern states, those errant Southern brethren, back into the national family. The moderate Republicans and the war Democrats in the middle of the political spectrum in the North hoped that Grant's magnanimous terms augured a liberal, easy, comprehensive peace, as the Herald put it. They favored a cautious approach to Reconstruction. They were in favor of some change, but not the kind of radical transformative change that uh, the abolitionist papers were advocating. Now, despite these differences, the abolitionist papers and the moderate or mainstream papers could agree about two things. One of those was that Grant was a hero, and the other was that Lee was a villain. We, we, we tend to have this image of Lee as a peacemaker. That is an image that, that uh, in a sense, we've projected back into these raw and certain days right after the surrender. For most Northerners, Lee was very much a figure to be feared uh, and distrusted at this, uh, at this moment. So if we look at Northern newspaper coverage of the surrender, again, in the first days after that news is flashed across the wires, we see Northern newspapers lauding General Grant, his indomitable will and genius, as a Philadelphia paper put it. Northern papers compare Grant to Napoleon, to Wellington, to Frederick the Great. They say the Appomattox campaign, which unfolded here, was a campaign for the ages without parallel in human history. This, these same papers portray Lee as devious and ungrateful and not to be trusted. An article in the Christian Recorder, again, the organ of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, described Lee, quote, as a desperate and oath-breaking leader seeking individual renown, even when mindful of the utter hopelessness of his espoused cause. The radical Republican New York Evening Post went one further. It took Lee to task for his April 10 farewell address. That farewell address to his troops proclaimed famously that the Confederates had bowed to the overwhelming numbers and resources of the North. I'll come back to the import of those words. But this New York Evening Post declared that farewell address to be, quote, a slap in the face to loyal soldiers, unquote. The idea that Lee was congratulating his men at the moment of defeat and not acknowledging the bravery and virtue of the federal soldiers seemed, uh, in the eyes of some Northerners, to be um, something worthy of criticism. So to sum up here, an April 11th article entitled The End in the, Federal, in the Philadelphia Press concisely summed up the dominant Northern interpretation of, of Appomattox. Just a few words could sum up that interpretation. Right has triumphed over wrong. That's how most Northerners saw it. Grant's victory, a victory of right over wrong. But here things get interesting, and this is my theme of divisions within each region, North and South. There were dissenting voices in the North. There were Northerners who did not believe that Grant's victory was simply a victory of right over wrong. Those dissenting Northerners were the so-called Peace Democrats, a, a wing of the Democratic Party, the opposition party in the North. They were sometimes called copperheads. It was a derogatory term meant to suggest that they were sort of venomous and uh, slimy and untrustworthy. So these uh, Northern Peace Democrats had been fiercely opposed to Lincoln's policies and had hurled all kinds of vituperative criticism at Lincoln. They, they condemned emancipation, they condemned conscription, they condemned Lincoln's suspension of civil liberties. Uh, and these Copperhead newspapers, <coughs> newspapers like the New York World and New York Daily News, accused the Lincoln administration throughout the war of sacrificing white men for a radical creed of emancipation and racial equality. The Copperheads antipathy to Lincoln suffused their coverage of Appomattox. Here we have a political dynamic that's not unfamiliar to us from modern politics. The Copperheads did not want Lincoln and his Republican Party to claim a political mandate from this victory. They didn't want Lincoln and the Republicans to conclude, good for us, we were the architects of this war and our party has won the right to, um, uh, to, you know, to prevail and to rule the country. The Copperheads denigrated the Northern victory and Lincoln's conduct of the war effort. They denied 
that the Union had won a moral victory over the rebels uh, and insisted that the Union had triumphed because it was more powerful, not because it was more virtuous or better run. Moreover, and again, things get really interesting here, editors of these Copperhead papers in places like New York City, men like Manton Marble and Benjamin Wood, were unabashed in their admiration of Lee. They praised Lee. Uh, they praised him for his, uh, 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 his uh, the skills of his generalship declaring him to be every bit Grant's, uh, Grant's equal and for his conduct at the moment of surrender. The New York World, for example, avowed, in their valor, their endurance, and their martial skill, Southerners were the equal to the North. The Confederacy, this New York paper said, was subdued by overwhelming numbers. It echoed Lee's farewell address. Again, divisions in the North. In the minds of men like Marble and, and Woods, these anti-Republican, anti-Lincoln, uh, Copperhead editors, the Grant's terms, his magnanimity, was a repudiation of the Republican Party's wartime policies of Lincoln's radical measures like emancipation. And these men ac accused radical Republicans of, of seeking violent retribution against Confederates and predicted that radical Republicans, men like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens, would try to undermine Grant's magnanimous settlement. So to sum up, there's no moment, however brief, in which Northerners in unison celebrate the Union victory. The victory is more complicated than that. The news from Appomattox, to use a modern day colloquialism, gets spun like news does today. It gets played to partisan advantage immediately. And we can see, uh, it's controversial from the start, we can see the power of partisanship to cloud this moment of victory dramatized by an incident in Portsmouth, New Hampshire on April 10. Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a crowd of about 2,000, a mob, uh, attacks the office of the Copperhead newspaper editor in Portsmouth. The crowd is made up of sailors, shipyard workers, uh, uh, a wide range of, uh, of denizens of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Why do they attack the offices of the Copperhead newspaper editor there? It was a man named Joshua Lane Foster. Well, Joshua Lane Foster had been intense in his criticism of the Lincoln administration during the war. He'd called Lincoln all sorts of names, spewed hateful rhetoric towards the president. Many uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, felt this man, Joshua Lane Foster, was a traitor to the Union cause. Now that the Union had won and Lincoln had his victory, this uh, group uh, who assembled outside of Joshua Lane Foster's office wanted Joshua Lane Foster to acknowledge that Lincoln and the Republican Party prevailed. So they demanded that he hang an American flag from the window of his newspaper office. Foster reportedly looked out the window of the office and shouted to the mob, go to hell. At which point, yeah, at which point the mob broke into his office and, 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 and destroyed his newspaper printing press. This shows you the depth of the resentment of these copperheads. Republican newspapers in Portsmouth, New Hampshire said Joshua Lane Foster had it coming. He was a skunk and a traitor, according to Republican, uh, Republican papers. So divisions in the North that cloud this moment of victory. What of the South? Let's turn to the Confederacy now. The dislocations of four years of grinding warfare had left the Southern press in shambles. Editors and printers had gone off to serve in the army. Basic supplies like paper and lead typefaces had become prohibitively expensive. Distribution lines had been cut and Yankee occupation had shut down many Confederate newspapers. So news of the surrender spreads outward from Virginia and across the South in fits and starts. It doesn't travel as sort of predictably and swiftly as it does in the North. As a general rule, not surprisingly given geography, People in the Upper South learn of Lee's capitulation before those in the Deep South did. Newspapers in the cotton states typically didn't announce Lee's surrender until the third week of April. Again, remember, I told you people in New York knew the night of the ninth. There are many people in the Deep South who don't know until late April. On the Confederacy's western frontier in Texas, for example, the news doesn't arrive until early May. So we have a very different scenario than we have in the North. There are some exceptions to this rule, generally proximity to cities and towns and to uh, the Union Army and to telegraph and newspaper offices and railway lines were factors in how learned, uh, soon people heard. But as a general rule, so Southerners um, far away from uh, the Appomattox front had to wait some time before they got the news. Though Confederate civilians learned of the surrender in a variety of ways, there's a clear pattern 
in Southern press reactions to the surrender, Confederate press reactions, with near perfect unanimity, Confederates insisted that Lee had achieved a moral victory in the face of defeat and that the North's overwhelming numbers and resources had decided the Confederacy's fate. Press reports on the Appomattox surrender, Confederate press reports typically insisted that Lee had only 8,000 troops available on the morning of April 9 to throw at a federal force of 200,000 or greater. Now we know the real numbers were that Lee had roughly 30,000 men within a 10 mile radius of Appomattox and Grant had roughly 60,000. Those were two to one odds that Lee had beaten many times before. But we see exaggeration here at this moment. Uh, we see Confederates editorializing too on the moral implications of this disparity. Lee with his 8,000 effectives, a Yankee army of 200,000, 500,000. The, the estimates uh, you know, uh, were, were pretty wild. According to an April 26 piece in the Edgefield Advertiser of South Carolina, Lee, quote, proved his lofty heroism and high moral courage by refusing to sacrifice his men to 200,000 butchers. This is the rebel, uh, rebel view of the Yankee army. Now, it needs to be noted that references to the Yankees' overwhelming numbers were not new. That phrase had existed in Southern lingo uh, and in Southern press reports since the early days of the war. Confederates knew they were outnumbered. There's no question, they were outnumbered. That was a fact. But early on, press reports, early on in days when Confederate victories were coming swift and fast, early on press reports had denied that the Yankees' demographic edge need be decisive. Perhaps the Yankees would uh, be divided internally along the partisan lines I just described. Perhaps they would lose the will to fight. There was a hope that decisive Confederate victories would neutralize that numerical advantage. By the time we get to Grant's Overland campaign of 1864, for, uh, however, in the spring of 1864, we start to see a sort of drumbeat in the Southern press about these overwhelming numbers. And the overwhelming numbers take on the connotation of sort of Yankee brute force and material might and of a war of attrition that on Grant's part that was fundamentally illegitimate. So in some ways the press is preparing the way. Should Confederates bow to overwhelming numbers, the press begins to suggest there would be no shame in such a defeat. So Southern civilians are primed to accept the idea that this is a war of might against right, if you will. And Lee's farewell address with its reference to overwhelming numbers and, and resources will sanctify that explanation for the South's defeat. As for Grant's terms, his magnanimity, and what they portended for the future, here again the Confederate press has a very different take than, the, than the, those abolitionist and mainstream northern papers than the dominant northern view. Most Confederate newspapers insist that on April 9, Lee had leverage remaining and that he'd use that leverage to negotiate with Grant, to negotiate honorable terms for his blameless men, terms that paid homage to Confederate courage, that extracted concessions from Grant, such as the concession that Confederate soldiers could take horses home, that bestowed political immunity on the defeated rebels. Particularly that phrase in parole passes, there's an exhibit uh, inside that demonstrates what these parole passes look like. There's a clause on the pa parole passes issued to Confederates that says they will remain undisturbed if they obey the laws where they reside. This was taken in the Confederate press as a kind of conferring of political immunity on these, on these men. Indeed, the Confederate press will argue in its coverage of Appomattox that Lee had not relinquished the moral high ground at Appomattox and that the surrender scene at the McLean House here in Appomattox was an enactment of Lee's superiority to Grant. So to give an example, a, a revealing a fanciful report on the conference at the McLean House circulates through Confederate newspapers in late April of 1865. This is purporting to be news, but it's a made up fanciful account. And in this account, again, this is a story referred to by the exhibit here in this museum. In this account, Lee offers Grant his sword and Grant refuses to take it. And according to this newspaper account, Grant turns to Lee and says, quote, General Lee, keep that sword. You have won it by your gallantry. You have not been whipped, but overpowered, and I cannot receive it as a token of surrender from so brave a man. Of course, U.S. Grant never said any such thing to Robert E. Lee. But the report seemed credible to Confederates because it affirmed this dominant Confederate interpretation in which Appomattox signified the triumph of might over right, Yankee numbers and resources, not Yankee virtue, daring, courage, skill, etc., had won the day. 
Confederate newspapers also expressed inchoate longings for an elusive victory that might still somehow be possible. In that spirit, the Augusta Constitutionalist vowed on April 21 that the gloomy news from Appomattox did not necessitate the, quote, folding of hands of the people in mute despair, but should instead nerve Southerners, as the paper put it, to more determined and united action. Exactly what they had in mind wasn't clear, but this seemed to be uh, a call to, to uh, steel oneself against defeat. An editorial on Lee's surrender in the Edgefield Advertiser of South Carolina, an editorial entitled Chaos, captured both the uncertainty of the moment and the depth of Confederate civilians' will to believe. The editorial wrote, quote, what is to be done? We know not, but let our people dismiss the idea that we are going to pass under the Yankee yoke. Nothing of the sort is going to take place. The editorial promised that the Almighty would make things right. Man's extremity is God's opportunity, as the editorial ended. But the South, too, was divided. This is something we sometimes forget. We tend to equate the South and the Confederacy, when in fact, as a, as a terrific book by William Freeling, the uh, uh, professor emeritus from Kentucky, a book called The South Versus the South has shown 450,000 men from slave states wore blue uniforms. He's referring here to Southern Unionism, a very interesting uh, phenomenon. The beating heart of Southern Unionism was African American resistance to the Confederacy. Slaves during the war fled farms and plantations by the hundreds of thousands to seek refuge with the Union Army, and they contributed to the Union victory not only as soldiers, but spies, nurses, scouts, teachers, day laborers, and so on. Indeed, seven regiments of the United States Colored Troops participated in the Appomattox Campaign. Their story is told here in this museum and in many of the events going on here over the next, uh, next few days. Fascinating stuff. For black South Southerners, in other words, the Union success at arms was synonymous with freedom. They were Unionists for obvious reasons. But there was a small group of white Southern Unionists, small relative to the number of Southern whites who supported the Confederacy, but symbolically important and a sort of thorn in the side of the Confederacy. And the motivations of these white Southern Unionists were, were varied. Some of them had Northern ties, family ties, for example. Some favored the economic development, the industrialization of the South. Some were resentful of the political power of the slaveholding elite. We find pockets of this Southern Unionism in mountainous upcountry regions of the South where plantation slavery hadn't firmly taken root like East Tennessee and West Virginia. But we find s small cells of unionists, if you will, unionist undergrounds, even in Confederate strongholds like Atlanta and Richmond. Fascinating story. So for these white Southern unionists, Grant's army was an army of deliverers. They hew to Grant's interpretation and the Northern press's interpretation of Appomattox, not the Confederate one. To give an example, in Union-occupied Nashville, Tennessee, the newly elected governor there, William G. Brownlow, who was long the voice of Unionists in Tennessee, marked the surrender by issuing a proclamation that designated May 4 as a day of thanksgiving prayer to the Almighty God. He also was editor of a Southern Unionist newspaper in, in, uh, in Union-occupied areas of the South. There were Unionist newspapers. This one, this is a great newspaper title, was called The Knoxville Whig and Rebel Ventilator. Yeah, and Brownlow rejoiced in the Knoxville Whig and Rebel Ventilator that the great general of, greatest general of the so-called Confederacy had been defeated by Grant, made to surrender to Grant on Grant's own terms. Brownlow attributed the Union victory to the blessings of Providence and the devotion of Grant's officers and men. Not to overwhelming numbers and resources, in other words. In sum, there never was a moment, however brief, in which Southerners in unison mourned their lost cause. The South is divided as the North is. And indeed, in the year after the war, in the wake of Lincoln's tragic assassination on April 14th and the ascendance of his successor, Andrew Johnson, these divisions over the surrender's meaning will get sharper still. And I'll end here by quoting from two remarkable newspaper interviews, one with Lee and one with Grant, that serve to illustrate this process, this contestation of what had happened here at Appomattox on April 9. A few weeks after the surrender, April 24, 1865, Lee, who's now back home in Richmond, agrees to be interviewed by a reporter. A reporter's named Thomas Cook. He represents the New York Herald, one of those papers in the middle of that northern political spectrum that I described. And this, a, an account of this uh, reporter's interview with 
with Lee. Lengthy account is published on April 29 in this New York paper under the heading, The Rebellion, View of General Robert E. Lee. So Cook began by asking about secession. Lee repeated his famous pledge from the eve of the war, a pledge quoted in the exhibit here, that save in defense of his native state, Lee would never again raise his sword. Uh, and Cook portrayed Lee as a sort of reluctant secessionist. Cook then turned to the surrender, and he invited Lee to share his views of the surrender. And Lee, in this interview, as it's related uh, by Cook, initially adopts the posture of a peacemaker. Lee tells Cook that he, Lee, deplored the assassination of Abraham Lincoln as a terrible crime beyond execration, Lee says, of Lincoln's assassination. Lee claims, according to Cook, that the South had long been anxious for peace, and had waited only for some word or, or expression of compromise or conciliation from the North. This is, seems, may seem surprising. Lee, the, uh, the, the greatest symbol of Southern nationalism and of its resilience, but this idea that Southerners have been waiting for a word of conciliation from the North was a standard anti-Republican argument, part of a charge that Lincoln and his minions needlessly prolonged a war that might have ended earlier if, op if only they had um, uh, not um, been so wedded to their radical agenda. Lee, in this interview, um, spoke, Cook th th uh, thought this was strange and interesting. Lee spoke as though he was a citizen of the United States. He frequently alluded to uh, his solicitude for the country's restoration of peace and tranquility, as Cook put it. But interestingly, even as Lee offered up professions of goodwill in this interview, he also offered a warning to Northerners. Lee put special emphasis on the following point. He said, quote, should arbitrary or vindictive or revengeful policies be adopted, the end was not yet. The South still had sources of strength, Lee said, which harsh measures on the part of the North would call into action. Lee warned that the South could protract the struggle for an indefinite period if extermination, confiscation, and general annihilation were the North's policy. In that case, if the North departed from um, uh, Grant's and Lincoln's template of malice towards non charity towards all, Southerners, Lee said, would renew the fight and give their lives as dearly as possible. So here, Lee, in this interview, his own, is giving forth his own political views. They come through strongly and unmistakably. He's proposing that the Appomattox terms were a contract by which the North should abide, that the North had promised leniency and caution. And this um, notion of an Appomattox contract, contract by which the North abide will be taken up by the Southern press in the wake of the war, and the Southern press will make the case, a case intended to keep change at bay, that any proposals for a radical transformation of the South are a breaking of this compact, and they'll fasten on those words, remain undisturbed, the promise the Confederates would remain undisturbed, and use this as a bulwark against social change. So to the second interview, and then I'll wrap things up. A little more than a year later, May 1866, right after the surrender's first anniversary, U.S. Grant gives an interview to the editor of a uh, Maine newspaper, the Lewiston Falls Journal. Grant at this moment, in May of 1866, is grappling with disappointment. Grant had hoped that his magnanimity at Appomattox would change Southern hearts and minds and convert former Confederates to the creed of free labor. But Grant had looked on with disappointment and then even horror as Andrew Johnson's amnesty to the defeated South, his pardon of the Southern elite, had resulted in the resurgence in the immediate aftermath of the war of Southern power and the prescription of, of the freed people. Grant's interviewer at this moment invited him, Grant, to muse on the surrender. And he asked Grant if Grant was surprised how quickly the rebellion had collapsed in 1865. And Grant said something very interesting. He said that he had expected the Confederates to hold out another season. And he offered that perhaps it would have been better if the rebels had held out. For then the Union Army, Grant told his interviewer, would have had the chance to impose the blighting effects of war on those sections of the South that had been spared destruction and thus bring to the Southern people, I'm quoting Grant, a realizing sense of the enormity of their crime and the necessity of a thorough repentance. Grant's saying perhaps it would have been better if the surrender had come in the fall or, or, or winter or a, a, another season of war to make Southerners realize the enormity of their crime. 
Again, here, Grant is giving voice to his understanding of what had happened at Appomattox. War had been the South's punishment, peace and his magnanimity, its chance for atonement. But the promised atonement had not come. Invoking the lost promise of Appomattox, Grant told this interviewer that Southerners were, quote, much less disposed now to bring themselves to the proper frame of mind than they were one year since when victory was new. Now, Grant says, they regard themselves as masters of the situation. Revealingly, and this was the most surprising thing I found in my research, Grant in this interview chose to take Lee to task. Lee was, in Grant's view, quote, behaving badly, unquote. Lee, uh, Grant said of Lee, quote, he is conducting himself very differently from what I had reason from what he had said at the time of the surrender to suppose he would. No man at the South is capable of exercising a tenth part of the influence for good that he is, but instead of using it, he is setting an example of forced acquiescence so grudging and pernicious in its effects as to be hardly realized. Grant on Lee, a forced acquiescence grudging and pernicious in its effects. What did Grant have in mind here? Lee had not gotten out on the, on the stump politically and proclaimed his political views uh, 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 overtly after, after the war, but he had given this interview, he had been um, interviewed by a congressional committee in which he had, uh, 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 again, reiterated this idea of, a, of an Appomattox compact by which the North um, must abide. He had issued his famous farewell address. All of these things Grant resented in the sense that he believed Lee was subtly but unmistakably denigrating the Union victory, denigrating it as a show of force rather than of skill and not giving Grant the credit that uh, and the victors the credit that they deserved. Grant believed that Lee, in the year after the war, had taken the low road, that he'd cast himself into the company of dishonorable men like Andrew Johnson and those copperheads, men who sought to turn back the clock as much as possible to return the Union to the way it was before the war. Grant believed these men were making the late rebels believe, as Grant put it, that they're just as much entitled to rule as ever. Grant's sense that the fruits of the Union victory were slipping away in the year after the war was echoed by progressive and moderate newspapers across the North. The Christian Recorder, for example, lamented in the spring of 1866 that the Southern elite and their Northern Copperhead allies still held the common people of the South in their grasp. And, then, and it said only when white Southerners shake off their social degradation would the nation enjoy the blessings of true peace. So we have a complicated picture. As the curtain falls on the first anniversary of Appomattox, Grant is chastened, but he's not despairing. We already have influential Republicans at this moment in the spring of 1866 suggesting that the hero of Appomattox, Grant, must lead the party in peace, the Republican Party, as he had in war. And Grant is coming to see that only by entering the teeming world of politics can he accomplish the work he'd begun on April 9, 1865. In conclusion, press coverage of the surrender and its aftermath belies the image of Appomattox as a gentleman's agreement between Lee and Grant, a healing moment that transcended politics. The Appomattox terms, as I've suggested, were contested and spun from the start and would serve as a touchstone for bitter and protracted debates over Reconstruction. Thank you. I'd be delighted to answer questions. Sir, in the back. Um, what influence do you think Joshua Chamberlain may have had in Grant's thinking and uh, arrangement of the surrender itself? So um, Ch the Chamberlain is, is an interesting case. Um, Chamberlain and, and, and John Brown Gordon, uh, who play the lead roles in that s surrender ceremony, stacking of arms ceremony, uh, drama uh, 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 story, um, are both men who, like, just about everyone else in this story are more uh, complex than um, you know mythology would suggest. There's more to them in their Appomattox stories than meets the eye. So Chamberlain, uh, uh, by the late 19th century, Chamberlain will be associated with this alleged gesture of honor uh, to Confederate men at the stacking of arms ceremony. But we have in the moment sources that Chamberlain wrote. Uh, a letter to his sister, for example, April uh, 13th, right after the surrender, in which um, Chamberlain makes it clear that he has no desire to relinquish the moral high ground to Confederates. That is to say, this debate about whether the terms are paying homage to Confederate courage or whether they're an emblem of Northern moral superiority, Chamberlain has been associated with the idea that the intention of the terms was to pay homage to Confederate heroism. 
But, but in the moment, I think Chamberlain's uh, uh, reaction um, was to feel very much that the terms in the surrender were, again, an emblem of northern moral superiority. He felt that there was a, 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 um, a, a, a right side and a wrong side, and that you, Chamberlain's own letter to his sister, for example, I quoted in my book, emphasizes um, the heroism of union men, their suffering, uh, uh, and, and, and their skill. Uh, so we're going to see this tension um, in, in, uh, uh, in, in accounts of the surrender. It's a tension, really, and this was something I had to grapple with when I wrote this book. It's a tension between the in-the-moment sources and the memoirs. Because what's going to happen is, over time, over the course of many decades, a cult of reconciliation is going to emerge. Uh, and, and by the turn of the century, Lee will be considered a national hero in the North, and, and, and stories of, of, uh, 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 of the, you know, the, the, the Lee offering Grant his sword and Grant refusing to accept it, and, and Union soldiers paying homage to Confederate soldiers at the, at the stacking of arms ceremony, and, and, and many other such feel-good stories will proliferate, along with the images of the veterans clasping hands across the bloody chasm and all the rest. So a cult of reconciliation comes along uh, in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. What I'm trying to argue here is that we shouldn't project that cult of reconciliation back into these raw moments right after the surrender. Because it, it, during these raw moments, people don't know what's going to happen. You know, we know that reunion would take. But those soldiers walking away from Appomattox didn't know if reunion would take. They didn't know whether Grant's terms would be accepted by the folks back in Washington. They didn't know what was going to happen. And so there's a great deal of, of, of anger and bitterness and uncertainty. Um, and we see a, um, you know, a, a Gordon is another figure who we associate with this cult of reconciliation. Gordon was, um, probably did more than any other person on the Confederate side to promulgate this idea that Yankees had promised not to disturb the Southern social order at Appomattox and that they needed to be held to that promise. So these men are political creatures. Part, part of, again, part of the argument of the book is that it's sort of comforting for us to think of our, our great soldiers as people who transcend politics. But, the, but that doesn't make a lot of sense, really. And, and Lee and Grant were, were, um, were very politically savvy men. You don't get to be where they were in the army without being politically savvy. And, and so I'm trying to say we Americans are a political people, and this was a political moment, and, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Yeah. Years later, when uh, Grant was dying with throat cancer and trying to finish his memoirs, did he return <coughs> to this issue? Yes. Uh, juxtaposition? Yes. Would we? Yeah. So, so. Talk about yeah, so I'm glad you brought up Grant's memoirs. Grant, I mean, for me, one of the interesting journeys here with this book was um, I, I knew a lot about Robert E. Lee, had been long fascinated by him. I grew up in Northern Virginia. It was, was kind of everywhere, but I didn't know much about Grant. So the challenge of this project was to really get to know Grant, and, and, and that was very fun and rewarding. I grew to admire him more and more and more the more I learned. That memoir of Grant's, written while he had throat cancer, published in 1885, is most people think one of the great memoirs in the English language, just an absolutely remarkable book that every American should read. And, and um, Grant absolutely, uh, uh, all of the, the attitudes I've attributed to Grant and to, and to the dominant northern position here, uh, all of those, um, those attitudes uh, uh, come forth in the memoir very, very strongly. Grant didn't believe that he'd negotiated with Lee at Appomattox. Grant believed that he'd had all the cards at that moment. Uh, uh, Grant didn't believe that his, um, uh, uh, his mercy was designed to exonerate the Confederates. He believed his mercy was designed to affect their repentance. Grant's bitterness at the way Confederates denigrated his victory as a, vic as a show of force, that bitterness comes through in the memoir. So yes, he returns to, to, uh, to these things. Now, at the point he's, he's writing the memoir, that cult of reunion is already quite strong, too. So it's a text that's, that, that is at odds with itself in some ways. You can see passages that seem very much to partake of that cult of reunion atti attitude, but you can also see moments where that bitterness is still pretty close to the surface. Uh, and, and for Grant, you, that bitterness at Confederates and Copperheads for denigrating the Union victory was tied up with, you know, this is a guy t uh, taking a lot of criticism, the Northern press in 1864 and 1865 called Grant the butcher. You know, he had a reputation for sending men fruitlessly to their deaths. Again, a, a, a war of brute force. And Grant felt that that was insulting to, to, to Union soldiers, to his generals, to his staff, uh, and, to, and to his men. 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, we talked briefly earlier. What are your, just on the broader view, what are your key ingredients or variables from the lessons learned from mathematics to uh, in, uh, enduring trauma? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you, you know, a, a, an honest answer. The honest answer is that um, I, I, and people feel different, uh, scholars I know who do study the 19th century have different feelings about this. Some people are quite comfortable drawing a direct line between 1865 to 2015. I'm not comfortable doing that, and I'm not comfortable doing it because, um, you know, the very complicated 20th century interview, drawing lessons I'm from 18, sorry, yeah. What, what, what are we drawing a line from? Oh, no, he's, he's saying what lessons for, App, how can oh. Appomattox help us understand contemporary international What's conflict? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my, so my, my, my own, <laughs> I'm drawn to the 19th century out of a sense, out of a, um, by, by the ways in which it's so different from the present. Maybe that's the best way to put it. To me, the 19th century, what's fascinating about it is that it seems familiar and accessible. You know, 16th century language, 17th century language is, seems remote, but by the time we get to the 19th century, it seems like these people are talking the same language as us. It seems accessible, but I think it's really a kind of undiscovered country that the differences between the 19th century and, and the present are very, very profound. Uh, and that's what draws me to it. And because the complicated 20th century intervenes between then and now, I'm hesitant about saying, about drawing analogies between the Civil War and current conflicts. What we mean by, by left and right and liberal and Democrat and Republican and all these things is different now than, than it was then. However, having said that, um, it, I am comfortable saying one of the lessons here is that wars never stay within the boundaries that we wish for them, right? I mean, this is, this is a great lesson of the Civil War. Uh, you know, people on both sides made promises of a quick and easy victory, uh, and the war was far more transformative than anyone imagined. So that's, that's, that's a, 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 an obvious takeaway. Um, and um, uh, 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 another... Um, takeaway would be that um, uh, things I want people to sort of take away from this, this sesquicentennial moment is that these figures, Grant, Lee, Gordon, Chamberlain, they are far more compelling as real human beings with all their flaws than as marble men. You know, again, we still have a tendency to want to put soldiers on, on, on pedestals, but, but, but the real human beings are, are we have far, we have far more to learn from these people if we grapple with their flaws, their flaws like flawed like we all are, than if we, than if we make them out to be uh, pre, you know, prescient and all-knowing, because nobody was, was, uh, uh, was prescient and, uh, and all-knowing. Um, and, and again, for me, then, the final um, analogy would be the one I've pressed here, which is to say, sometimes we have a tendency to imagine you know, to romanticize this period, even with all the death and destruction, the, 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 the 19th century, and to imagine that it was a simpler time. It wasn't a simpler time, you know? The, 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 again, all of the same impulses um, and, 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 uh, and um, uh, there was a very complicated, divided political spectrum then as there is um, now. So, so th those are the kinds of analogies I'm comfortable drawing. I, we talked earlier and I, 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 uh, about the fact that my husband is a historian of war and of contemporary conflicts and World War II period and its aftermath. There's a lot of chatter at our dinner table about wars and how they end and our, our kids are rolling their eyes like, war, 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 will all these people ever shut up? You know, so, so, and I think my husband is probably more comfortable thinking in those terms that, that, than I am, yeah, yeah. Ah, that's a great question. Paper. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's a great though. question. So that was again for me a sort of surprising discovery. So the Blight book, Blight will speak here uh, on on Sunday, is a great kind of for historians paradigm shifting book. He's the one who is, who has told the story of how this cult of reunion takes, and it's a cult of reunion in which. The Northern, Northern and Southern whites celebrate the manly heroism of soldiers on both sides and try to push under the rug all those uncomfortable issues of slavery and, and, and political divisions and so on. Uh, as in, uncomfortable and not according with the feel-good story of heroism on both sides. So I, I, I agree with Blight's trajectory where my book and my research offers a slight corrective is to say in Blight's book you get the sense that that cult of reunion just swept everything you know, to the side. Um, and what I'm arguing is that there was a counter-narrative 
uh, a counter narrative on the part of Northerners who said, Frederick Douglass put this most famously in 1878, he said there was a right side in this war and a wrong side, uh, and no sentiment ought to cause us to forget that. Well, I think there were more Northerners who felt that way, including Union veterans, white and black, than blight lets on. There was more pushback against the idea that there's a kind of moral equivalency between the Confederacy and the Union. More Northerners saying, no, we were right. You know, we have had the moral high ground and have it still. So African American veterans play a very important role in this story. I, I um, found that the role that USCT regiments had played in at Appomattox and in the war, generally 150,000 black Southerners fight in blue uniforms. This is, makes a huge, it's, it's many people like Granfield, this is a decisive edge for the North. The role they'd played remains a point of pride in black communities. And we, uh, uh, sometimes when we, we try to recover African American thought, we focus exclusively on Douglas or Du Bois or some of the great icons. But if we look at black ministers and educators and, and, and communities, we see them celebrating the Appomattox anniversary every year into the 20th century as a freedom day. A day, a, a, that date for them signifies in some sense, the moment the promise of Lincoln's emancipation became real, because during the Civil War, freedom follows the Union Army, where the Union Army is successful, you have de facto freedom, where it isn't, the, the Emancipation Proclamation can't be enforced. So it's only with the destruction of the, the Confederacy's greatest institution, Lee's Army, that freedom becomes real. But they celebrate that as a moment of liberation in which African Americans were among the liberators because those USCT troops were there. So they're liberators and liberated. So this looms <coughs> very, very large in, in African American memory of the war. And I found celebrations of April 9 in churches in Philadelphia, in Chicago, up until World War I. At that point, World War I sort of supplants the Civil War as the test case of whether black patriotism will, will will result in full citizenship. But until World War I, this looms really large and it forms part of that counter narrative. So in other words, they're pushing back against the lost cause mythology. They're pushing back against the idea that there's a moral equivalency between the North and the South. And they're pushing hard. And in order to, to, um, to see this, we have to look beyond Frederick Douglass and a few of these very famous figures and look particularly at black ministers who were really instrumental in pushing this, uh, this idea. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very good and important and valid connection across time. For African Americans, there was this kind of providential narrative of their service to the country. So a, 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 a typical epigram in black writings about Appomattox was from Crispus Attucks to Appomattox, right? There's this kind of story of, of, of African American patriotism to which these later chapters you know, would, would, uh, uh, would, would be added. So absolutely, they're trying to say there's this long standing case for our citizenship. Um, uh, which our service has ha, has earned us. So uh, absolutely, they're 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 uh, they're taking the long view here. And I should mention this. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. This was just luck for me. The preeminent African American historian of the late 19th century was a man named George Washington Williams. He was a brilliant, prolific man. As it so happens, lucky for us, he volunteered for the USCT and was here in Appomattox in one of its regiments, just a teenager. And, and so he saw it all. And in, his, and in his sort of landmark black histories of the late 19th century, he wrote about what happened at Appomattox. So we had you know, the best possible kind of witness and interpreter uh, in, 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 in Williams. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so Grant has a mandate from Lincoln. They've met twice recently. He knows what Lincoln wants. Lincoln was in favor of hard war and soft peace, malice towards non-charity towards all. Lincoln's theory of the war, again, was that, was that secession was the work of a minority of, of, of sort of agitators who had made dupes of the Southern masses. And again, this notion of disenthralling the Southern masses, bringing the errant brothers back into the fold was very much Lincoln's working assumption. For Lincoln, the goal of the war was union. Right, so, so he's in favor of a soft peace, and he promulgates a wartime reconstruction proposal in 1863 um, that's meant to speed the reintegration of the southern states uh, into the Union. Um, Grant knows from Lincoln that he has a mandate only to handle military matters. So Grant's 
um, offer of, of surrender by parole to Confederates is a military convention. It had the uh, same uh, convention that had applied at Vicksburg, surrender by parole. Grant knew that his mandate was to get Lee's army under control by offering surrender by parole, but that the fraught political questions of whether and if these surrendered Confederates would again vote or would hold office or would have property other than slave property that had been confiscated restored to them or whether those, whether, when and if those states would become part of the Union again. Grant knew that was not part of his brief. Those things were to be decided by the elected officials the civil, in the civil realm in Washington. So there was a strict line Grant had to obey. So Grant, as Confederates say, your off parole offers conferred political immunity on us. Grant will say, no, my parole offers protect your lives. But those political questions were not mine to decide. Now, interestingly, it's again another kind of um, disjuncture in the story that made it hard to, to write about. Um, Lee doesn't have such a clear mandate from Davis. You know, at the time Lee is getting Grant's messages, Davis is on the lam, you know, and, and, and Lee has very uh, inconsistent communications with him. Davis is a last ditch guy. He doesn't want Lee to surrender. Lee has to improvise to an extent that Grant uh, doesn't. So it's, and, and again, disjuncture, Grant left this wonderful memoir in which he tells us, you know, beautifully how he felt at that moment. Lee never wrote such a memoir. Lee dies in 1870. So to fill in the Lee's part of the picture, you have to really read um, between the lines a great deal. Yes? I know rural historians don't like this question. <laughs> Thanks for starting that way because I can. Uh, but I'll ask it anyway. Yeah. Uh, what else? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's irresistible. So it gets back to that question of what Lincoln wanted, right? So we sort of know what Lincoln wanted, because Lincoln said, Lincoln again had promulgated this so-called 10% plan in which once 10% of the Southerners in a given state gave an oath of allegiance, they could be a kind of vanguard that would, that would, that would bring that state back into the Union, a lenient peace. We also know that Lincoln said to uh, his uh, cabinet, um, right before the assassination, that it would suit him perfectly well if Jefferson Davis would quietly slip off into South America and never be seen again. I mean, Lincoln did not want to have to make martyrs of these Confederate leaders. He wanted, he, he feared, I mean, he wanted to make the Union whole again, so he didn't have any stomach for any kinds of major reprisals, um, but he also didn't want to make, make martyrs of, uh, uh, of them. Lincoln um, wanted a soft, uh, a soft peace. Um, Lincoln was an infinitely better communicator than Andrew Johnson. Lincoln had a way of, com of communicating to the northern public um, uh, what they should do and why. Maybe he would have had better luck than Johnson did. We know, too, though, that Lincoln, in the last speech he gave, for the first time ever, and the first time an American president had done this, said that he would consider uh, giving voting, uh, he would consider supporting voting rights for African American men for, as he put it, those who've served the army and the very intelligent. We know that Booth was in the audience when Lincoln said this, and that when Booth heard Lincoln advocate black suffrage, Booth said to himself, that's the last speech he'll ever make. So we know Lincoln was considering this thing that was considered very radical, even by most Republicans. So what Lincoln undoubtedly would have fared better than Johnson, you can't underestimate Lincoln, but Lincoln would have come up against the same um, barrier that Johnson did, and that is the, uh, the in some ways, the, the hollowness of his fantasy that the white Southern masses could, could be disenthralled and turned against their leaders and turned against their cause. Lincoln would have found, as Johnson did, that the mass of white Southerners was deeply devoted to those leaders, to Jefferson Davis and to Robert E. Lee, and that Southern nationalism was strong and resilient, uh, and that changing hearts and minds was much, much harder than Republicans had wished and imagined. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.